Well, it's great to be back here. I haven't been in this building for, gosh, I don't know, a, a couple of years anyway, and uh, pre-COVID even. But uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about uh, has already been hit upon in terms of some specifics from Bob. And uh, we'll uh, try to put it in a slightly different context, uh, and if you will, a somewhat more social context. What I want to uh, sort of uh, emphasize is that when we're talking about ecological succession or any other types of habitat management, we're really looking at being part of the system. Uh, when I was working for the center, a lot of people talked about people coming in as polluters or people coming in as intruders, not part of the system. Socially, we are and ecologically, we are. And uh, to the degree that the system works, so do we. And uh, I think that that's a, a useful perspective as we begin to look at habitat management. Uh, so let's look at uh, ecological succession from the history and biodiversity and that uh, context of man being part of the system. Uh, I'm going to use some quotes from uh, authors who are in and out of the Chesapeake Bay watershed, although the watershed is our focus. This particular one is just outside of, uh, is a view of the of what some people used to think was the forest primeval, the murmuring pines and the hemlocks. And in fact, in a sense, that's true. But this is what probably in the East, one of the few uh, untouched uh, native forests left. This is the Cathedral State Forest, a 400 acre uh, patch of woodland on US 50, just across the Maryland border in West Virginia. Worth visiting because it shows you what the old forest might have looked like. Was this the forest that John Smith encountered? Probably not. Sam Drogi wrote a really nice uh, summary and it really dates back to 1966 when he published this in the Audubon Naturalist News. Many of you know Sam from the Breeding Bird Survey or as the bee man with the fish and wildlife folks. He wrote that during Jamestown times, woodlands predominated but not the dense open unbroken canopy most envisioned. Regular fires, largely set by Indians grazing by elk and bison and contiguous beaver populations kept the understory open and maintained in many areas and maintained many areas in grassy stages, suppressing forest regeneration. Large tracts of savanna and grassland occurred prominently along the coast, that's us, kept open by the actions of permanent Indian settlements. Large openings also occurred throughout the Hagerstown Valley and surrounding what is now Baltimore. These regions held prairie species such as bison, heath hens, and an extensive prairie flora. The tool that Native Americans used to maintain this landscape was one we've just heard about. It was fire, and it was set rather regularly. The Dutch merchant David uh, Peterson de Vries wrote in 1632 that the land is smelt before it is seen. William Wood in 1634 wrote a tome called New England's Prospect in which he said, fire consumes all the underwood and rubbish which otherwise would overgrow the country, making it impassable and spoil there, that is the Native Americans, much affected hunting. In those places where the Indians inhabit, there is scarce a bush or bramble or any cumbersome underwood to be seen in the more champion ground. And a quote we heard uh, just previously came from Jesuit priest Andrew White who traveled through Southern Maryland. A coach and four horses may travel through it without hesitation. Heath hen was mentioned. It was probably one of the most abundant bird species on this landscape. It is a race of the greater prairie chicken. This is what uh, one sketch of it looks like. And this is a greater prairie chicken today. You can see the resemblance and uh, perhaps also see that uh, uh, the greater prairie chicken, of course, is famous for its luck behavior and booming. There was a uh, heath hen, the last one disappeared in Maryland in 1860. Uh, again, a race of a, a bird whose species still exists, but not here in the East. And it was so abundant that at least uh, I have heard that landowners were admonished against uh, about feeding it too often to their slaves and indentured servants. I've heard that same kind of comment for a variety of other things landowners were admonished for doing. So it may be apocryphal, but it is true that some folks wrote that uh, the bird was so abundant and so tame 
that it was silly to waste shot on. We don't have, of course, photographs of what that early landscape looked look like. We do have some fairly uh, good descriptions, but uh, one of the uh, uh, somewhat artistic views uh, was prepared by artist John White, who spent 15 months in what is now Northern North Carolina along the coastal plain. And he returned to uh, England with some 70 watercolors, which engravers turned into uh, various types of prints involving American people, plants, and animals. This is one of uh, his better known ones, I guess, showing a uh, godlike looking Native American standing in front of a landscape that is hardly a forest primeval. In fact, what we're seeing are patches of uh, corn, actually probably the three, three sisters of corn maize, uh, I'm sorry, maize, uh, the curcubites and beans growing together in hills. In the background, a highly managed uh, forest of nut trees and fruit trees. This kind of landscape is probably not just the artist's imagination entirely, but probably represents uh, something that impressed Andrew White and others uh, as they uh, traveled through the Americas at this time. On a landscape like this, there are estimates that each household, each Native American household required nearly 40 acres of land to sustain itself. But uh, that 40 acres included fields that were left fallow to be planted in subsequent seasons as they practiced an early form of crop rotation. By the time the uh, pioneers had arrived and the first colonists as well, uh, Native American types of agriculture were adopted. William Cronin in a book called Changes in the Land uh, wrote, bark was stripped in an encircling band from each of the larger trees and grain generally maize was planted Indian style in mounds, not in rows beneath them. Removing the bark prevented the trees from leafing and eventually killed them, thus allowing uh, enough light to reach the ground for the trees to grow. Undergrowth was uh, burned in early spring to suppress the original vegetation and the trees were removed as they eventually rot. At the end of several years, a cleared field was the final result. And this is a diorama from the Harvard forest in Petersham, Massachusetts, showing uh, the same landscape depicting it at various times. Here, the landscape in 1740, after this pioneer family had cleared its first field for uh, growing crops. The nice thing about it was that although they didn't really know much about fertilization and nutrients in the soils, after five or six years, the uh, field would become essentially non-productive. They simply girdled more trees and cleared new fields. And after about 20 years, they could rotate back Native American style to the original field. Enough nutrients had come in with rainfall to make the land productive again. Okay, so the major crops were Native American crops, as I said, maize, often mixed with uh, beans, grown in hills that they hoed to get hoed up, uh, hence the term hill of beans, and also supported by the curcubites, the, the squashes and melons that were also Native American crops. While tobacco was uh, our first cash crop, in fact, both tobacco and corn stripped the soil of its nutrients uh, fairly quickly. Again, uh, early pioneers could simply grow more trees and clear more land, but that was not very profitable in terms of uh, uh, agriculture and in terms of supporting the growing communities of the uh, young, what became uh, America. And so, uh, Advocates, even up prior to the revolution, began to advocate uh, the use of plowing landscapes, a cleared landscape, sort of what they uh, uh, used to have in Europe, and to import that over into America. Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, and others were big components of what this was called high agriculture. And here's one of the instruments that they used. Instead of fire, they used the mold board plow to actually clear the land. Uh, and to till it up. But to do that, the land had to be cleared and uh, that had to be done again using fire. 
Cronin again wrote, the alternative method of clearing gradually became almost universal in the second half of the 18th century. Under this system, trees were felled with an ax, sometimes during the summer months, late enough in the season to discourage crowding from stumps. They were allowed to lie until the following spring. Then during the driest part of May, fire was put to the scattered heaps of wood and leaves. All but the trunks would burn and the charred remnants of these could be sawed in half, piled together and set afire once more. A lot of the early landscape literally went up in smoke. And that included some of the forested parts, which, in, which were in the uh, hillier parts of our Chesapeake Bay watershed, the foothills of the Appalachians and Alleghenies. The consequences of that in terms of siltation into Chesapeake Bay are, are really worth another talk. But let's just look at what those landscapes might have looked like because later on we were able to get the, the camera came into being and we could see what goes on. By the way, the forest was cleared, uh, what forests were, there were, were cleared not only in the lower agricultural areas, but also up on the higher hills where the wood was harvested to create charcoal to fuel the iron furnaces at places like Antietam. The lower uh, left picture here shows a view of Harper's Ferry taken around 1900. Oops, let's go back to that. There we go around 1900, looking from the Maryland side toward the hills of Harper's Ferry across the Potomac River. And you can see that those are not forested. At the time of the Civil War, uh, if you were to, to climb the uh, mountains like Maryland Heights, you could actually look down into the city, not through the trees, but just simply over the, the scrub. And uh, the Harper's Ferry was kind of a sitting duck, if you will, for lobbing artillery into uh, the town itself. Now, if you climb Maryland Heights, you can't see anything for the trees. And the trees are this big around. Here's some other pictures. This is taken at uh, Penn Mar in 1903. I found this postcard somewhere. And it, looking down across Washington and poss possibly parts of Allegheny counties, showing how that cleared landscape might have looked uh, post Civil War. Here's the Civil War battlefield, one of Matthew Brady's photographs at Petersburg, Virginia. Uh, now you, I cannot find the location where that picture was taken, so I can't get the new perspective, but I know the Park Service is very interested in clearing back some of the land so that people who visit there can actually see what that landscape looked like during the battles. It's all been, if you will, recovered. Clinton's Ditch is one of many ways in which the conduits uh, for moving from the east to the west occurred. The uh, uh, 19, uh, 1803 was the Louisiana Purchase. It, it began to open these lands in the Ohio Valley and west. And uh, this is in part because uh, once again, farmland became very non-productive. There was no way of really managing it, especially on the scale of land clearing that we inherited, that we experienced. And so sometime close to around the Civil War, over much of the East, farmland was simply just abandoned. A little bit less here on the Eastern shore because we had a, a nice big cypress swamp to invade, but nonetheless, uh, a lot of abandonment. And that set forth, of course, the trees in the seed bank and the invasion of trees, which set up what we call today, ecological succession. And so succession became of a, a major component of the changes in the land from the Civil War on. I won't go through those stages because uh, Bob did a nice job of that. But we can look at this summary of how the US forest uh, cover looked. When we look at the early colonies, I think that these numbers are a little bit high. I actually think the percent of our Chesapeake Bay watershed was more like 80% forested given what we now know about the history and the coastal plain and the use of fire by Native Americans. The land clearly was cleared for major agriculture and timber with the plow-based agriculture coming in post-Civil War up to at least the Civil War. And then uh, sometime around the Civil War, a large amount of abandoned land and uh, of course, depression and other issues uh, associated with large amounts of land use uh, go on with that. 
Uh, to give you, I think I have some numbers here. Let's see if I can find it real quick. Yes, uh, again, in Drogi's paper, by 1900, farm acreage in Maryland had dropped from 5 million acres to 2,200,000. And farms in Maryland dropped from 50,000 to 14,500. So it's not just a matter of aggregating smaller farms into larger ones. We actually had a huge decline, almost 50% decline in farm acreage at that time. So our landscape today uh, works out to be about 60% uh, oh, or so forested, agriculture about a quarter, urban about 10%, and the leftover is undeveloped park land and lands in transition. All of the forest you see in this picture, however, is at least second growth. There is no basically uh, uh, what I would call virgin forest left with a few exceptions of a small acreage here and there and the uh, acreage just outside of the Bay watershed at Cathedral State Forest. Today we have what I call a working landscape. And uh, there are in fact uh, issues concerning working, working landscapes. A lot of folks think landscapes that are working, farmland and all that are just beautiful. And they certainly are. The Oreo cows in the upper left there are one of Talbot County's most famous stopping places for tourists. Uh, that's the moon setting over a, a horse pasture. And uh, yeah, maybe even the farmers kiss their cows once in a while. Um, an agent uh, from Vermont Extension wrote that Americans still firmly believe in the agrarian myth of pastoral landscapes, people with friendly and rural folk living wonderful lives based on solid family values. That's a nice myth to have, but in fact, working landscapes will also have dirt at season. They have smells when fertilization is going on. There may be clear cuts, although I don't advocate them, but they're, you know, they're clearly older forests do get cut and harvested for timber. And of course, we have these fields that are basically monocrops. Uh, nowadays on the Eastern shore, it's wheat, corn, and soybeans, a three-year crop rotation over a period of two years in some cases. But one of the things that I wanted to point out is in this working landscape of farmland, transition lands and forest and so on, it's really the key to our local biodiversity. There are species of birds, grasshopper sparrows, bob whites, meadowlarks and all of that, that frequent and breed in grasslands, shrubs and the like. There are other species of birds that like uh, later types of uh, ecological succession habitats, maybe 20 years old or so, yellow throats, cardinals, which are somewhat ubiquitous everywhere, birds that uh, also then all nest in pine forests and trees. And then we get into our oak history, hickory forest, which uh, some of us consider to be the climax community of our succession. But in fact, we're losing our oak trees here in the east to beech and maple. And so succession is still continuing in lands that are not managed or otherwise untouched. But as a leader of bird walks, I can take members of the Talbot County Bird Club and in about a 10 mile radius from Easton, I can visit these various habitats and see all of these species. This is the key to our local biodiversity. This is very different from the kind of biodiversity we're talking about in tropical rainforests. This is a biodiversity maintained by our working lands. And it would not be as diverse if these lands were all uniform. Okay, some data from the North American Breeding Bird Survey. We've seen it before. Here's one of our grassland species, the grasshopper sparrow. The red indicates significant population declines since 1996. These data were gathered up through 1994. <clears throat> Here's a general summary. I really only want to pay attention to the, the four uh, bark charts on the uh, left side here, which show grassland species actually significantly declining from 1996 to, uh, 1966 to 96. Okay, that wetland species have been doing well, thanks to Ducks Unlimited and our no net loss policy on wetlands. And uh, woodland species, interestingly enough, including some of our forest interior birds, were in fact uh, increasing slightly. It wasn't until after about 2010 that 
uh, management organizations, including National Audubon, began to recognize the fact that it was the early successional species, the ones we're concerned about here, that were actually declining most. And yet the data were there for years before then. Everybody wanted to save wood thrushes, but nobody seemed to be interested in grasshopper sparrows. Well, we've seen what the result of, of that kind of neglect could be. This, these are data for 18 breeding bird survey rights, routes on the Eastern shore showing Northern Bob White. You may remember these routes have 50 stops over a, a, pure, a course of 24 and a half miles. If you see any number greater than 60, it means that they were hearing or seeing at least two Bob Whites per stop. Uh, I do two routes, I've been doing them since 1982. And uh, last year I got one Bob White. Eastern meadowlarks haven't fared much better. Uh, once again, the decline in these grassland species, which has been going on since the 60s, if not before, are really critical. Well, as I said, it's a working landscape. It's a landscape in which man is part of the system, our economic, our cultural, uh, even our uh, ecological uh, well-being depends on being able to maintain that landscape. And the kinds of changes that we've seen, both historically and even today, are in fact of a scale that we can't expect the DNRs or the federal governments to come in and buy up and maintain the land. So as Mike Parr said, you can't protect all the habitat. You have to work with the landowners in production landscapes, he means working, in farmland, pasture, and forest. And I think that's really important. But one other caveat, since we're dealing with ecological succession and successional habitats, and we heard this from previous speakers, you have to manage that habitat. You can't just set it aside and leave it alone. And the easiest, most, I think, efficient way to do that is to work with landowners who are managing that habitat as part of their own working lands. Instead of just coming in buying it up and setting it aside and spending money that way, why don't we work with the landowners themselves? That's the way it was before the Bob White decline went on, and that's the way it could be now. Finally, just a quote about working landscapes to finish this up. This is from Royce Hansen, who at the time was chair of the Maryland Environmental Trust. He defined a working landscape as one that maintains and works to enhance the responsibility of private landowners individually to improve the land for successive generations of those who work it and collectively to pass on to each new generation a landscape that is a greater environmental asset than they received. Moreover, a working landscape is an irreplaceable cultural resource. That's the kind of landscape I hope we're able to maintain when we talk about early succession and restoration of the northern Bob Whites and birds like this prairie warbler, a really good scrub breeder here on the eastern shore. Thank you.